Let's do it. A bunch of people on today. We got like an international, we got people from all over the place, dude. So yeah, I'm nice. super excited uh, for the conversation today. Anything cold calling related to you guys, obviously, is uh, something that I, I really like jamming with. And um, we have uh, Bilal Batrawi on the call today. If you guys haven't seen us collaborate on stuff together, uh, he's got major street cred. Okay, He's been like <laughs> on the founding sales team of six or seven startups. He advises a lot of startups. Um, and really what um, I look up to you, man, uh, in uh, Bilal is just your approach and mindset around like messaging and especially being provocative and not being this like kind of lame uh, prospector or salesperson that's like too afraid to like elicit an emotional reaction. <laughs> Life's, too to Life's too short. Life's too short. Welcome to the to the webinar, man. It's it's always fun to jam with you. Uh, it's my honor. It's my honor to work with you. You're 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 a top influencer for me. I love I love participating in anything blissful processing. J Bay, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> cool. I'm yeah. Um. <laughs> So what would help uh, Bilal? We were talking about this a little bit before. There's there's two kind of things before we get started. Um, one, if you have a specific question that comes up, please use the Q&A button in Zoom. That can filter them out, and then we can make sure to get to those questions, as many of them as we can. In the chat, though, right now, what I would love to hear from you guys that would really help Bilal is what is the number one objection or two objections that you get when you're cold calling? Let us know in the chat. What, what kind of objections do you get? Yeah, stuff that stumps you or trips you up. Scott says voicemail. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the best voicemail advice that I heard was actually Marcus Chan a few months ago posted his his voicemail technique. And I've been doing this for a while. I don't get I don't get floored very easily. His voicemail technique floored me. It was really, really smart. Probably the best voicemail script I heard. So I don't I don't have memorized off my head because I've not used it, but when I read it, I was like, damn, that's a that's a smart way to leave a voicemail. So I, I check out his thing. I have to dig it up. Maybe we can share it later. It was really good. Yeah, I can actually dig it up while we're going. Um, yeah. One of the things that, and I'm seeing a lot of different things, you know, bad time to talk right now, COVID, call me later. Um, I don't know if you had planned on talking about this, but uh, gatekeepers, you know, it might be kind of an interesting thing to talk about as well. Uh, I'm satisfied, so why change? And then uh, Jerry's asking, say that name again, Marcus Chan. I'll drop Marcus Chan. Call in for you guys. Really yeah. good dude. Yep. Uh, another Asian. In the, uh, <laughs> There's not, not, not a lot of us out there. Uh, no, not. <laughs> let me drop this in the chat for you guys. There you go. Yeah. So not interested. Anything in here, uh, Bilal, that you're seeing that's sort of out of the ordinary or pretty typical? No, these these feel good. I'm, I'm glad these are coming up. Send me an email. I'm seeing that a few times. We're happy with what we have. Not interested. Yep. These are, okay. It's what I expected. Run into a meeting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. These are the ones I was hoping to see. I'll pass your message along. Yeah. God, I hate that one. Yeah. That's a super annoying one. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it's kind of like the, your approach is around being like, you, you like to be pretty blunt, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Um, but just to kind of set the stage, man, um, where do you feel like you're like, how did, can you give us just some uh, insight into like, how did you build your cold calling chops, dude? I mean, you've done a lot of this kind of different stuff, but what was your first sort of experience like? And it was there, like, what have you learned along your journey of like doing this type of work? I was this close to being fired. In my first sales job I'm talking about this close, completely changing my trajectory story time real quick, get called into an Applebee's back in Florida. I was an SDR first job out of college, never done sales in my life, had like an economics degree, wanted yeah. to be an analyst, but that was the only company I was hiring was this startup called Trinet that was in Bradenton, Florida. And they had me cold calling. I'm like, why? It's so weird and awkward and stupid to like pick up the phone. And I was freaked out about calling executives of like fast growing tech companies that had just raised millions of dollars. I'm like, what am I supposed to say to them? I'm just some dude that graduated University of South Florida. What am I supposed to say to these people? It was really, really awkward. Okay, <laughs> that's the scene, right? A couple months and I'm sucking at my job. Garbage, zero progress. Manager calls me in. He says, look, we like you. You're a really nice guy. You seem smart. We're going to fire you in two weeks unless you get it together. So I want you to sit down and listen to me on calls and not do anything, but just pay attention. I'm like, done. Yeah. Right. So I sit down with my manager and he does live cold calls in front of me and everything he's doing is against 
what they showed me in the sales training. Everything he's doing Mm -hmm. is against what he showed me in the sales training. He's like unprofessional, like loose, just having fun, kind of messing with people, trolling a little bit at times with, with people on the phone. I'm just like, this is not what the sales trainer said to do, man. Like, this feels right, though. This feels good. Like, you seem to be almost enjoying this. Why can't I get a piece of that? Right? Like, I want to enjoy this stuff, too. So that's that was the, my first foray into cold calling. And I realized, wait a second, there's another way to do this. And since then, I've done six sales trainings, Jason. I did uh, Sandler's, I Wayne by Design, Challenger, uh, MJ Hoffman, a bunch of them. And none of them showed me this stuff. So I'm like, okay, wait, there's something to this, right? This is outside the norm. So that being said, that's kind of how I got into why I do the cold calls this way. And I wanted to find a logical way that made sense to me because the one thing that I'm not going to do is something that makes me feel uncomfortable. I, I, I just don't have that personality to like stomach through it or just, you know, shut up and do what you're told. I, I just, that's not me. And I can't do that. When I feel uncomfortable about doing something, I guaranteeing myself failure because I, I just, just not me. It's not my habit. So I had to make it mine. I had to. Yeah. Dude, I love this. I'm super excited. Uh, you got some stuff prepared for us. Let, let's dig I in. I do. I do. So I'm going to show you guys how I went about thinking this. And uh, like I said, if, like Jason said, if there's questions, fire off the questions. Let's jump to the beginning here. All right. So first off, one of the biggest things that none of these sales trainings taught me that was really confusing to me was like, how do I go from a name on the screen in a CRM to a meeting? Like, wh- what do I do here? that I can create a repeatable process that I can at the very least minimize my chance of failure and set myself up for the best chance of success. Because at the end of the day, there's only so much I can control. I'm calling somebody random in the middle of their day, interrupting them. I have no clue if, you know, their grandma just died, you know, their favorite cat ran out the door in the morning. They ran out of their favorite cereal. I don't know what's going on in their lives. Did they just get promoted? Like, There could be a million things going on on their end that would impact my call. So I got to control what I can control. So I started thinking about this idea of chunking. This is a common idea in psychology about when you think of a difficult task and you can't see a path to accomplishing it, you chunk it, you take it in stages. And I realized all of my cold calls had a pattern, the ones that were successful. And this was the pattern. This was like the recipe, the first five seconds, the next 15 to 20 seconds, the next one to seven minutes, and then closing out the call. All my successful cold calls had these four elements to them. And if I nailed them, I had a higher chance of success. So I want you guys to think about that now. You're going to measure yourself on these four pieces of a cold call, and that's going to be your barometer, your your measure, your measuring stick to know how you're performing, not just against your peers, but yourself right? Because that's the best competition is against you. Screw everyone else. Be your best you, the best version of yourself. This is the measuring stick to know if you're doing it right. So that being said, the first five seconds of a call, you're interrupting their day. Acknowledge it. Embrace it. You're an unsolicited cold caller. That's a fact. So I'm with Jason uh, on permission-based openers. That's what I always use. My permission-based opener was, hey, Jason, I know you're not expecting my call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. That was my permission-based opener. I've been using that for 10 years now. It hasn't, hasn't done me wrong. I know you're not expecting my call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. I love that right. line. What are your thoughts on, because there's this whole kind of interruption you know, kind of thing. And a lot of people in our space, what they'll say is, well, the prospect picked up the phone. They didn't have to pick up the phone. Um, why do you still proceed with like acknowledging the interruption? Because it's bullshit. I've, what do you mean? Like they could have been picking up the phone because a loved one's in the hospital and they weren't sure if that was a doctor calling them back or they were expecting a conference call. I've had that happen where like somebody's like, I literally was expecting this to be the conference call. And I was like, I'm sorry. Right. Like, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. It's just good manners to set that expectation being like, and when you say it confidently, my goodness, because look, they're not professional phone answerers. You're a professional cold caller. So who's the burden on them or you, you have to bring the professionalism. So it's like, you're not expecting my call. 
do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. And I'm like, okay, well, see where this is going to go. And you're going to get one or two answers, right? You're going to get uh, some sort of like, yeah, continue. Or you're going to get some sort of like, no. And if it's a no, it's really simple. Like, okay, my apologies. When's a better time to call you back? Would you prefer later today or tomorrow? So you let them know like, hey, just because you're going to hang up on me right now, doesn't mean I'm going to let this go. I'm coming after you again. And you do what you say. And if they say uh, later today, but great, I'll call you around three. Is that fine? I'll let you go now. And you hang up. You be the first to hang up. It's really powerful when you do that. Or they're going to say no. And you're like, can I call you back later today or tomorrow? And they're like, wait, oh shit, I can't get this person off. They might actually go back to be like, okay, tell me what you're calling about. And if they say, yeah, then you proceed. Cool. So that's your decision tree, right? That's the two outcomes, some sort of yeah or no. And you know how to proceed after that. Is there anything that, and let me know if I'm skipping ahead, because I know you have some of this stuff. Is there anything that um, you have advice around either tonality, speed of delivery? Like, how do you think about that kind of thing? Because the first five seconds, what I've seen with coaching clients is they don't necessarily have to say the right thing if the tonality and the delivery is very deliberate. It's very confident. Yeah. Like you can ask like the big no-no question in cold calling. Hey, Bilal, how are you doing today? I've heard lots of people I work with ask that and the other person's like, oh, I'm doing really good. How are you doing? You know, and it's a lot of like the tonality and delivery. So let, again, let me know if I'm skipping ahead, but is there anything that we should take in consideration there in the first five seconds? If you can do that, great. And that's like ideal. I'm assuming that you're like me and you find you're more introverted than extroverted and you don't get excited by cold calling someone. And I've been doing it 10 years and I still don't get excited. Um, so for me, I still ask permission because that's just like, maybe it's a cultural thing. Maybe it's like a, a, just the way I was raised in my household, but that's how I do it. You're right. I've heard reps too on my team being like, how are you doing? I'm like, if you called me up and said that, I'd be like, shut up. And I'd hang, you know, like, but it worked for them. So you're right. There is something about tonality because I, I related to this. It's sort of like that moment. We've all experienced it when you're sitting in a room and you get this feeling that someone's looking at you and you turn around and sure enough, there's a pair of eyes on you. And it's like, how the hell did you know to turn around and look directly at the person that was looking at you? You got that feeling, right? Same thing in cold calling. You can send out an unconscious vibe just from your tone, just from your demeanor. If you're smiling versus like sitting down hunched over, that actually changes how your voice sounds. So yeah, controlling your voice matters, 100%. It's like psychology. It's not even, we're not talking like pseudoscience here. We're talking about like straight scientific proof on that. Yeah. And then one other thing, because this is stuff that people ask a lot is uptones versus downtones. Any, Any thoughts there? No, just do you. Yeah. I, I talk kind of monotone. I've been told that. I'm like, well, it is what it is. You know? I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't do like highs and lows. Sometimes too. Um, and for those of you, you know, watching and you're wondering what uptones or downtones, it's like, how are you doing today? Versus how are you doing today? Right. It's a different kind of delivery. Um, yeah. I think people overthink tonality. <laughs> I think so too. God, I mean, just stand up. Yeah, we'll get to this later. It was like stand up, smile, and just make the call, yeah. right? And 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 it helps when you have something meaningful to say, which is this next part. Well, this is actually a good fe- because here's the thing: most people call to make a pitch. So goodness gracious, try pumping yourself up when you're about to vomit on a person about how you're the number one platform for blah 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 blah. Yep. Right. Like if you're actually calling to say something meaningful to them, it makes it a lot easier to make the cold call. So this is probably the biggest change that I don't see a lot of techniques teaching, which is the next 15 to 20 seconds. So I get, I get a yes. I get a, okay, what's this about? Right. And now comes the magic moment. This is what like people say pattern interrupt and they use that wrong. This is real pattern and interrupt. You're going to ask a provocative peer question that's going to open them up and get them talking in the first 20 seconds of a call. And let me tell you right now, you want to talk about setting yourself up success for cold calling for the rest of your life. If you can get the person you're cold calling talking in the first 20 seconds, you are setting yourself up for massive success, massive success. 
and it's hard. The reason why this isn't taught is because it's not easy. You're like, this isn't something that you're just going to watch this webinar, go back, flip a switch, and it's just going to rain money on your phone. Not going to happen because it takes a lot of thought and consideration how to nail the next 15, 20 seconds. But you're going to ask a peer question, a what or how question that is provocative that gets them to think. And I'm going to share with you guys four examples of those in just a moment. So don't worry, they're coming. So now we're going to ask this peer question. And the goal is get them talking, not you, right? Because great conversations are two-way, always, always. And get them talking about who? Themselves, because we love talking about ourselves, right? So that's the 15, 20 seconds. Then there's this moment where they say something. You're going to respond to what they said. You're going to um, trade your cleverness for bewilderment. This is a, a quote from Rumi, famous uh, Persian poet. Trade your cleverness for bewilderment, and you're going to uh, try to seek to understand what they're saying. So now I'm going to ask you a provocative question. You're going to respond, and now I'm going to be like, tell me more about that, Jason. Or, you know what? I hear that a lot. I'm surprised it's coming from you, though. Or you know, I don't hear that a lot. Why is that the case with you? Why are you different? And I'm going to try to understand. And those one to seven minutes there are going to be my qualification questions to see if you're the right fit. And then I'm going to take control. So now I'm going to do some qual qualification somewhere up in here. And then I'm going to close out. I'm going to control the conversation and end it. This is a, I, the one piece of advice that pisses me off is people say, never be the first to hang up. If, if a manager has ever told you that, they're wrong, dead wrong. You should always be the first to hang up. There's so much power in that. While the conversation is going well and I've got the information I need from you and now I've got what I need to set the next meeting, it is so powerful to be like, listen, Jason, it sounds like you have a lot of questions about this and I'm grateful for that. I promised you in the beginning of the call that I'd be brief and I know it was an interruption to your day. Would it make sense at this point to set up 15 to 30 minutes in the next week or two to talk about this further? or whatever time frame you want, right? 30 minutes, hour, whatever it is. And you close. There's so much power in that because then I'm like, oh shit. Like again, this guy's like a professional caller. He knows what he's doing. So you close out, right? You end it. So those are the four stages of a successful cold call. And so far so good. You know, hey, what if the person you're talking to is not the correct person in the company? This framework is under the assumption, I'm assuming that uh, that was kind of weird, under the assumption that I'm assuming <laughs> that, uh, that this is like the, this is the person that you want to get a meeting with. Even if it's not, you could still like the, this is a great, I, I actually in several instances used to call the wrong person in the company that I knew was one to do one to two degrees removed from the person I wanted to gather intel. So it showed that I did research. So my, I might switch my um, provocative questioning to my a research-based question where I say something like, hey, Jason, listen, I, I know you're next week on the call. Do you have a moment promise to be brief? You give me a yeah. And be like, look, I, I know you're the controller and I know that Tom is a CFO and I know this probably falls in Tom's court already. And I was planning to give him a call, but I figured I'd also speak to you very briefly regarding X. Though it's not yours, typically, I'm wondering, could you tell me a bit about what your company is doing today regarding X? And I call the wrong person, right? With that intention. Like I state it from the beginning. Like I know what I'm doing here. Again, I'm a professional caller. I know you're not the right person, but you're one or two degrees away from the right person. And I plan to reach out to them, but I figured I can ask you a few questions and you'd be surprised how much people will tell you. You'd be yeah. surprised. I love what you're saying there too, because you've mentioned this phrase a couple of times, professional caller. So it's like, be a professional, you know, when you're doing this stuff, like really, really know your stuff. Um, I love that. You know, it's like, it's a kind of a different lens to look at it with. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question that uh, Rashab, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there. Um, they're saying, hey, that's like two questions in the first 20 seconds, permission and a fear question, which those weren't fear questions necessarily. But without showing value, will the prospect be open to sharing details? Yeah, because value isn't on the timeline of a, a microwave, a Pop-Tart, you know, in a microwave. 
Mm-hmm. It's not how value works. I mean, really think about value. What's value to you? What what kind of value, you know, goes as fast as you popping a bag of popcorn in the microwave? It doesn't work. You're not, you should never be trying to give value in the first minute of a cold call. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, start way to set a bar that you're always going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> Like you're, you're, in, you're calling me to interrupt my day to tell me something that you think is valuable to me. And you're going to do it 20 seconds after I just heard your name for the first time in my life. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck with that. I love that. What is this whole value thing too? Like what's, what's your take on the, on the word value? Do you feel like it's overused? Yeah. I, I, I there's two words I'd love to ban from sales, help and value. Both of them are just abused and useless. I help people I'm like, no, don't help people. People don't want your help. They're the heroes, not you. And value. I'm like, what does that even mean anymore? We just like say the word, like, just because I think it, you know, it just flows out of the mouth of managers now with like no second thought. Value. I'm like, what does that mean? Right? You're cold calling someone. Literally, the word cold is in 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 the thing we're doing. <laughs> There's no value in this for them. It's for me. It's selfish. It's the most self-centered thing to do. I'm calling you to get your business. <laughs> the goal is not to give you value. The goal is to qualify you. But if I ask a provocative peer question, I can at least spark some interest from you. The value is going to be when you see what I got. Yeah. Love so it, good man. question. Yeah, and you're going to come back to those uh, questions. And I'm getting a couple of, of messages about my microphone. So let me know, you guys, if you're having trouble hearing me. My microphone is like, it's it's pretty close to my mouth right now. <laughs> so I don't know if there's much else I can do for you, but um, let's keep it rolling. Okay, so now, now you have a framework to diagnose your calls, okay? So this is what I want you to do from this point forward. You think about your calls in these four stages, and you diagnose when you get hung up on, right? Did I get hung up on in the first five to 10 seconds that I get hung up on in that next 15 to 20 seconds that I get hung up, hung up on somewhere in that first minute to six, seven minute mark, or did I not be able to finish closing them and get the outcome that I wanted after a conversation? And you will be able to self-diagnose and more importantly, self-correct. Because if you're losing them right at the beginning, it's your tone. Maybe you're in a bad mood. Maybe you're not doing the right permission-based opener. Maybe you don't feel comfortable. Take a step back right? If you're getting hung, hung up on somewhere in the first 30 seconds, you're not asking them the right question. It's not hitting right. People don't find that interesting, or they don't think you know what you're talking about when you ask that question. And then if it's a qualification stuff, again, so these are the stages now that you can self-diagnose and self-correct. And the best cold callers in the world do this. They think about their call disposition in these four stages, Okay. What about so, so, the, um, yeah. is there anything around the, the qualification piece? Like if this is, I, cause I get this a lot. Cause I teach something I call question stacking. It's, it's, it's sort of a similar concept um, to yours. Um, I want to add like a pure question, you know, kind of element to it, but mm. with the qualification, what can happen sometimes is, I don't know, depending on the questions that we ask, uh, the people, the way that they respond to it is like, it feels like, uh, like it's too much work to answer the question, you know, or it's just like, uh, you know, I don't have time for this right now kind of thing. Um, what would you recommend if someone's getting hung up in those, like that qualification stage where they're asking their questions, what are some do's and don'ts, I guess, maybe in that stage, if someone's struggling at that point, if you're getting hung up on at that point, odds are you're asking questions that are either not things that they feel comfortable answering or you are asking questions in a way that feels intrusive. It's either one or the other, right? So either they don't want to tell you, or you're being a little bit too intrusive and they're getting a vibe from you of like, this is, this is too salesy. I didn't want this, right? Because if you got to that point, if you're in that one to six minute mark in a conversation and you didn't get hung up on prior to that, and they, they've kind of gone through with you, you, you're, you're like, you're, you know, this is your highest place to, to fail right here. All right. Yeah. This is that. This is where people fail. Mo- yeah. Most most calls fail here. All right. Yeah. If you get to this point, you really shouldn't be dropping the ball if you're at qualification. So that means you need to rethink what you're asking, tone it down, maybe maybe change the order of the questions. You know, David Primer talks about substitution heuristics. The order of what you ask changes 
how people answer. So maybe you need to put easier questions in the beginning, a little bit tougher questions later. So those are sort of the remedies that you'd want to take if you were getting hung up on at that stage. Got it. And then any advice, and let me know again, if I'm skipping ahead around the qualification questions, can you give like a, an example of like an intrusive way of asking a qualification question versus something that, you know, kind of like lets the prospect, like puts them a little bit more at ease or disarms them at least a little bit and gets them talking? Yeah. Like a, a, a way to be intrusive is like, you know, if you were just, if you were too blunt and you're just like, uh, what's the vendor you're using now? And they purposely didn't tell you the vendor that they were using up until that point. Mm -hmm. um, odds are they didn't want to tell you, duh, right? Like take the clue, right? So you'd want to be a little bit soft and be like, I noticed up until this point, you haven't mentioned the name of who you're using. Our competitors are usually X, Y, and Z. Would you be willing to tell me who you're using now? So I have a frame of reference. Yeah. All right. So now all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, the cat's out the back. He just, this is the competitors. But like, yeah, it was one of those you said. And then I'd be like, okay, which one? All right. Cause I just said them. Yeah. So. so it sounds like a lot of it is like your, um, like your mindset is one of curiosity. Like, um, yeah. so for example, um, like I always like to use personal training, you know, analogies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like, if you approach someone that was overweight, and you were a personal trainer and said, Hey, you look like you could use a personal trainer or, Hey, you know, what kind of trainer are you using? Like, you know, if you asked it like that, the person's immediately on guard yep. versus like some sort of, um, Hey, I know that you come to the gym a lot. I, I see you here. Um, you know, a lot of times what people struggle with is like keeping consistent, like with what they're eating. Yep. So that they're getting the most that they can at the time they're spending in the gym. Have you ever put together like a meal plan? Or what kind of meal plan have you put together? You know, like that kind of thing. It, it really gets them talking because I ask people a lot when I get them on calls and even through LinkedIn, just chat. Like I ask them about who they're um, like, who they're working with or if they're considering other companies. And most people will tell me. Yeah. You know, so, so it sounds like is, is the mindset a, a, a big part of it too? Like does that yeah. drive the tonality? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It really is. And, and again, this goes back to like, well, then what are you saying? Right. And like a lot of this is the right setup because that first 15 to 20 seconds, if you nail it, it actually makes the next one to seven minutes work like butter. Like it makes it buttery smooth. And here's the thing. So this, this is, this is the biggest paradigm shift in how I cool call. There's two things I want you guys to consider. One is this, am I calling somebody to show them or talk to them or ask them about something that they consider new? Or is my product or service viewed to them as something that's rip and replace? What is my buyer's conditioning? What do they think when I call them about this thing that I sell? That's really, really important because that dictates what you're going to say in those first 15 to 20 seconds. Okay. And buyers really don't think about, or sellers don't really think about buyer conditioning. Like here's an example of buyer conditioning. If I sell toys, right? And I tell you batteries not included, you don't bat an eye. Because you are already conditioned as a buyer to know that toys don't come with batteries. If I sell you shoes and I tell you shoelace is not included, you'd spit in my face. You probably wouldn't buy the shoes. Because the idea that I would buy a pair of shoes without shoelaces is ridiculous. But aren't the shoelaces just as functional to the shoe as the battery is to the toy? So we have, we're conditioned as buyers to find certain things acceptable and certain things not. One of these is do I look at this as a new vendor, a new product, a new service, or do I look at this as a replacement to what I currently have? That's one, okay? And then the second thing is now the question you're going to ask is going to be dictated by the way your buyers view you. So I'm gonna give you four examples because debt the fluff. This isn't just some webinar about frameworks. I'm gonna literally give you word for word examples so you can see how this works. So the first one is trying it. At Trinet, we were calling CFOs of fast-growing tech companies. So my provocative peer question to them, and my product was rip and replace. I was trying to replace their insurance broker with my service, my SaaS-based insurance product. So it was rip and replace, not net new. It was a new way to do it, but it was not a net new product in their minds. Okay. So this is what I said. Hey, Jason, I know you're expecting my call. Do you have a moment? I promise to be brief. You know, what is this about? Like, my name is Bilad and I'm calling from Trinet. We're the largest PEO in the country and we service over 130,000 lives. 
we, I, I find that, or I often hear that the number two cost after payroll for most small businesses is healthcare. And that's been going up nine to 15% year over year. How are you handling your cost rising that much? That was my 15, 20 second pitch. All right. So some little social proof there. I'm calling from a company you've never heard of us. We're big. Doesn't matter what we do. Nothing about what we do. And then immediately switch to you. You, I know about your business. I already know that your number one cost is payroll and your number two cost is healthcare. Oh, and by the way, I know that it's been increasing on average nine to 15% year over year. What are you doing about it? The number one response that I got to this question was, wait, who is this again? Because the question was so calibrated and good. They were like, how the hell did this random person who just called me ask me such a good question? Because that was the thing I knew that the CFOs of fast growing tech companies were dealing with. And uh, we have a couple of people just asking about objections. We'll get to that, you guys, in a second. So they could definitely give you an objection here. But um, dude, let's get to some of the other examples. I'm kind of transcribing these <laughs> for you guys. Okay, no, problem. Problem. no problem. So that's Trinet, right? Rip and replace. So now I'm asking a question about benefit costs and immediately getting them on something that they hate and they find very emotional. And you'd be surprised if people are like, yeah, we've been switching brokers for years now or... Um, what can you do about it? That's just how it is. Or some people would be like, we don't actually, we, ours last year was 6%. And I'm like, damn, that's good. How'd you do that? Right? I never hear about people beating the average. And now we were having a conversation. Okay. Full story. This was a session replay tool that allowed people to see the visitors on their website and how they're interacting. So what did we say? We used to say, hey, have you ever been on a really crappy website where you find yourself slamming your mouse in frustration because the UI sucks? Well, we call that a rage click. And we allow for you to see when your customers or visitors on your product are clicking in frustration. Can you do that today? Well, how, how do you go about tracking that today? So that was our provocative question, right? Again, emotional. We were connecting it to, have you ever been on a shitty website, slamming your mouse in frustration? Yeah, I have. Okay, we call that a rage click. We allow you to see when your clients and website visitors are doing that on your product. How do you see that today? And the answer was, well, we don't. Or, well, we've got some analytics tools, but I don't think they track that. You call it a rage click, you said? That's funny. And now we're having a conversation. Yeah. All right. Oh, man, there's so many. Uh, I. I'll let you give the examples and I want to kind of go into like the framework of this. This yeah. is, I, I love this because it's, it's got those emotional elements, like you said, and it's kind of funny. Yep. Now like, full story was new. Most people we spoke to never had a session replay tool. So we were challenging the thinking of like, yeah, you've got analytics tools, but you're not tracking user behavior. So how do you know when people are pissed off? the same way you feel pissed off on shitty websites. I, you know, that's not happening to you, right? So there was, a, there was a trick there. Now, Stratify, rip and replace. We were calling um, advisors, wealth advisors that already use a, a smorgasbord of tools to try to do the one thing that we could do. So we knew that people were patching together a bunch of tools to try to do the one thing that we wanted to do. So this was our script, right? Again, permission-based opener. We get the, um, okay, yeah, what is this about? And then we go right into this. Uh, we used to say, uh, we find that a lot of wealth advisors are cobbling together three or four different tools like, and then we list our four biggest competitors in order to do risk profiling, profiling for their clients. How have you been doing risk profiling for your clients today? Right? So right out the gate, we'd mentioned the four most common tools in the industry are top competition. And we'd, we'd acknowledge that people cobble these tools together. And we asked, how do you do it today? Because we knew everybody cared about risk profiling. It was a question of how do you go about doing it? And man, the answers that we would get, these wealth advisors would just go off. They'd be like, yeah, we've used so-and-so that product sucks. Or we have that actually now we just bought this. Interesting that you mentioned that, right? People always knew the tools that we were talking about. So it was pretty bold and risky to name our competitors right in the first 15 seconds, but it got people to open up. 
because we showed them we know the risk profiling space like the back of our hands. Very okay. cool. Love this one too. And it's part of this kind of transparency kind of thing that uh, you talk about a lot. Todd Capone talks about it a lot. It's just like, dude, people already, like they're already thinking this stuff. Yep. No different than at the beginning of a demo, they're thinking about what it's going to cost. Like, why not just like openly talk about your competitors and do the opposite thing that most salespeople are too afraid to do. And it's cannonball like in water's fine. Cannonball in. You're not, yeah. no, nothing's going to happen. It's okay. Trust me. They're one Google search away from knowing anyways. Yeah. Love right. It. If your key, if your competitors are, are even ha worth half their weight, they're buying the keyword of your company. Mm -hmm. Right. Like when, when I search, when I search these companies, you typically their top competitor is the, the first result, right? It's an ad. That's the game we're in today. Okay. So now finally bio IQ, bio IQ was also net new. So stratify is rip and replace bio IQ was net new. We knew that our companies that we were calling uh, did not have a service like ours. And what we were selling was um, a way to immunize employees using Walmart pharmacies, which was pretty novel because most companies today, when they do immunizations, they do it in their, um, they do these like um, health fairs where they get all the employees together and do like a big health fair and immunize them that way. And we're like, screw that. Just send them to their local Walmart and we'll track it all for you online. It's a very different approach. So at that time, there was a hepatitis A outbreak going on in the country. So we were capitalizing on that. So we would call up people who worked at certain companies, um, typically food service, and we'd be like, listen, um, the, the most recent stats for your state show that cases have risen X percent week over week. How are you handling immunizing your employees from the hepatitis A outbreak? Right out the gate first 20 seconds and these um food safety and hr people were just like oh i didn't realize it was that much or like i heard about it but i didn't realize it reached that point yet or they'd be like yeah we're actually on top of it that's a major concern for ours like it was so emotional right it was just like such a calibrated question to what they were obsessed with what they were just meeting on internally that people would just open up to us right there ah dude i love this so I think one thing that this has in common with the question stacking framework that I teach is like, you can't just ask a question, you know, like if you just go in and with Trinet, for example, and all you said was, Hey, how are you handling rising costs of insurance or uh, how you, how are you handling rising costs of benefits? It doesn't do anything to provide any context to the person. Um, it doesn't allow you to kind of like almost empathize with the person a little bit and be like, Hey, I, I like, I understand your world, dude. You know, so it's like huge display of social proof and you've got like education packed in there. It's like all of these things packed into this like uh, stacked like question. Um, so a couple questions here, because I'm just seeing kind of uh, some people stuff. How do you find like some of this stuff? And, and feel free to use one of these as an example. Like how did you how did you guys find out and get to the point that that was the question that you were going to ask? OK, great, great. And, and this is what I'm going to say. Let me back up for a second. Why isn't this common? Why was this not taught to me in the six sales trainings that I did? Because this is hard, guys. Yeah. Like I'm giving you four examples and you might be like, oh, this is really interesting. Now you're going to go back to your desk and be like, shit, <laughs> how, do I, how do I come up with a question like he did? It's hard. It's not supposed to be easy. If it was easy, then everybody would be cold calling and, and I'd be sitting on a beach somewhere, right? Like it's yeah. just not how it works. This stuff is hard to figure out, but it is worth figuring out because it will set you up for so much success on the phone. So these calibrated peer questions, Jason's right. There is a pattern to them. Number one, there's some sort of social proof or validation in the beginning, right? In all, all four cases, there was some sort of social proof or validation. And in the case of Trinet, we mentioned how many lives we manage. So it was a big number. And we mentioned we were the number one PEO in the country. Not that that mattered to anybody. It was just a social be like, look, I'm not calling from my basement. Like this is a legit company. You may have not heard of us, but we're for reals, right? In the case of Full Story, there was nothing referencing Full Story because it was a tiny little startup with like a million in ARR and like 30 something employees. So who the hell knows this? So it was never about that. It was about mentioning something that was related to them, validation, right? Of like, you know, when you're on a shitty website 
and you're just slamming your mouse in frustration because we've all experienced that, right? So you want some sort of social proof or validation to start. Then you're going to use either some statistic or something related to their business to show that you're not just some fool. You're a professional caller, right? You're not, this ain't amateur hour, open mic night. You're legit. You're Dave Chappelle. You know how to run this show, all right? Center stage, you are got the mic. You know what you're doing. And that's why you always frame it. In the case of Trina, it was, hey, look, I already know what your number two cost is. It's health benefits after payroll because I know what your number one cost is. And by the way, I know how much it's been increasing year over year, nine to 15%. So I'm not some schmo, right? In the case of Stratify, I was like, I already know you cobbled together these four tools. I'm not an idiot because I talk to I talk to wealth advisors all day, so I already know what you have to do to create a good risk profile nowadays. It kind of sucks, right? In the case of BioIQ, it was like I already did the research on your state. I know what's going on. Like in Kentucky right now, you're seeing a week over week rise, sixty three percent in cases. This isn't a game. So you you put some sort of um, you know validation there that you understand what's going on. And then comes the question. And the question is typically almost exclusively a what or how question, because it has to be open-ended. What are you doing? How are you handling? How do you see? It's about them, not you, right? You're making them center stage when you ask the question. Tell me about what you do for that. And that's how you unlock this peer question. And by the way, time it. It literally takes 15 to 20 seconds to say all that. So you literally go from hello to permission-based opener to this question. And next thing you know, in the first 30 seconds of a cold call, you got them talking. And typically, this is what happens. Like I said, the number one response, the way you know you're doing this right, is people will respond with, wait, who is this again? Because they're so floored by the quality of the question, they can't believe some random stranger just picked up the phone and called them and asked them that. And you know what you do? You repeat, that's all, you know, nothing different. Oh, uh, I'll start from the beginning again. Uh, My name is Bilal, I'm calling from Trinet. And I was wondering, considering that your second highest cost after payroll is health benefits, with them rising nine to 15% year over year, how are you handling that cost rising? Dude, I, I love this, man. I just dropped like kind of the formula for this into the chat, you guys. The other thing too, I'm curious your take on this, uh, BLL as well. If you have trouble finding provocative like stats because your company's marketing doesn't hasn't provided that for you, I just threw six websites in there. These are all like the big consulting companies. They have a ton of really great industry-related data where you could look at insurance and it'll show like what's increasing over time. You could look at logistics or whatever it is that you're selling, there's probably like a really in-depth study that one of those consulting companies has done or some sort of case study where you could reference that percentage increase. Um, I just started doing this with a client. They uh, help with like customer support and like helping companies when they get like really just burdened. And their their provocative question is, uh, hey, Bilal, uh, we actually mystery shopped your brand over Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And I was kind of surprised. It took 24 hours to get a response from you guys. Ooh. What's typical during that time? Or is that typical? Or what do you normally see during that time? And I listened to the recordings. Dude, the person is floored. They were like, uh, floored. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, wait, what? Like, how long did it take again? You know what I'm saying? That is so good. That is so yeah. good. So, um, okay, we got 13 minutes left. Should we keep moving? Or do you want to spend yes. some time on this part? No, so so this 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 let me say this. So this this changes. Now you can see how this completely changes the dynamic of the call. Because most let let's let's back up. What what's the standard for cold calls? I pitch you in the first 30 seconds. Yep. That's the standard, right? That's the status quo. That's what your buyer is expecting you to do when they give you permission. And you're going to completely throw that out the window and ask them a really good, thoughtful question. So you completely stand out from a sea of sameness. Mm -hmm. I mean, head and shoulders above the rest when you do this. Now, you're going to, you're going to, it takes a couple swings to get the right question. 
like the stratify question, we, we initially came up with four versions of that and found that the right one was cobbling together these four tools was the right one. So you want to come up with a few variations and test it out. And again, you self-diagnose. We found out that we were getting hung up on a lot faster when we asked the other three questions. And this fourth question got us the most conversations. And we were using Connect and Cell so we could track it. And we were seeing about a 15%, a little bit more than 15, it was like 15.6% conversion from conversation to meeting using that script, which is insane. Yeah, that's solid. It's insane, right? Because we were just converting that high. If we can get them on the phone, it was really easy to get a meeting. And the ones that we weren't getting a meeting for, we were getting clear details, knowing when to follow up, right? We were getting clear no's or clear yet, clear maybes that we knew what to do next, right? Maybe not right now, reach out to me later kind of stuff. So that's how you know, again, self-diagnose with these questions. Um, yeah, maybe we should stay a second on this because this is pretty, this is this is it. Like you get this right, then you can see how your qualification can be really smooth. Because then like at Trinet, I was going back and being like, well, uh, give me some context to your business beyond what I can find on your website. Like it's telling me on LinkedIn, you have about 200 something employees. Is that right? Or, you know, and then I could dig in to see how many employees they have, who they currently use and so on, qualify that lead and then set a meeting. Mm -hmm. all right. It all fed back into that peer provocative question. That was a what or how question that got them talking. All right. Cool. Love it, man. Um, so then we got this of like, what do you control, right? How does, it, how does it help you deliver this now that you have something meaningful that you're going to ask? You're not just calling somebody to bug them or talk to them about how you're the number one digital blah, 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 and some unique selling proposition that they don't care about. Right, you're calling them to ask them something about their business that you know they care about. That's a big confidence booster. It made me feel a lot more comfortable when I did cold calls, but it also helped to like have good posture, to know that at the end of the day it didn't matter. Like if they hung up on me or the call didn't go well, big deal. It was just one call and millions of calls that are going to go on today. So they didn't. And I, literally, I'd call people up sometimes two weeks later and they wouldn't even remember who I was. Right. So it doesn't matter. And, and, and you get to control it. Right. It, it, you know, if it's not going well, be the one to hang up. If it is going well, be the one to end the call. You know, don't, don't give them the steak and the sizzle, just the sizzle. It's like when you're, when you're at the like chilies and they come out with those like fajita things and you hear it sizzling. Right. And you're like mouth waters a bit because the sound is so, so uh, enticing to our brain. Like you get to control it. Give them the sizzle without the steak right? When they start getting interested, that's when you pull back and be like, well, hold up. Sounds like you're interested. Again, I, I wanted to be brief because I know I'm interruption. When can we set up a meeting? And smile, smile and control your tone. Like you do these things and you follow this pattern of the four stages of a cold call, you're going to see an improvement immediately, immediately in your results. Yeah, we talked a lot about smile, tone. You're big on posture, me too. Like stand up, you know, when you're making these kind of things, you know, controlling the call. Um, I love it, man. I think we got a little bit of time here to dig through some of the objections. Yeah, objections. So objection. Let's. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll kind of prompt you through uh, the chat here, or what I see in the Q and A. It looks like Jerry. What's up, Jerry? He's got a question. Uh, the big objection he gets is we're all set. Yeah. Now it depends. It depends who's saying it too, right? Of course. Depends who's saying it. It depends when it's being said. Okay. Because now that you're asking a provocative open-ended question at the beginning of the call, odds are you're not going to get we're all set. You still will. I'm not saying you won't, but you're not going to get it as often as you did before when you were pitching. Because it's really easy to hear a pitch and be like, all set. No, nope, that nope, I don't hear anymore. Thank you. But when you ask a question, it's a lot harder to be like, all set. Right. So in some cases, when I asked the question, I heard all set. I was like, all set to what? My apologies. I, I didn't follow. Right. I'll play, I'll play the fool. Like I didn't, I didn't quite follow what you meant. Help me understand what you are. You're saying you're all set to nine to 15% year over year increases in your benefits. I, I didn't, right. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. My apologies. And so you play the fool, let them try to explain themselves. Right. 
Other times when you get like an all set, uh, like in the case of Stratify, when we would list our competitors, we'd be like, oh, my apologies, just to clarify, because I, I, I want to make sure I, I put this in so you don't get bugged by me anymore. Are you saying you're all set because you're using one of those competitors I listed? Right? I'd specify. Tell me why. Give me the why. Right? It's okay. No issues. And other times it'd be like, I just back off for a second and be quiet. Give it like one to two seconds of quiet and just be like, you know, I probably called you at the wrong time anyways. I mean, what are the odds that I picked up the phone and called you when you're thinking about this? Is there a better time of year that I should follow up regarding this thing? Like maybe when you have like a, your current solutions contract is expiring or something like that, really calm, right? Really low tone, mm-hmm. right? So those are the, there's different ways to play it, right? But all of them are blunt. Like don't dance around it. Just, just be blunt. It's okay. Because odds are you don't, there's so many things outside of your control happening on the other side of that phone. If somebody's really not interested, don't try to fight that fight. That's not the hill to die on. <laughs> you know, call them back in a month and they won't even remember who you are. No big deal. Dude, I love it. So good, man. <laughs> uh, here, let's look on. Okay. So, Ricardo asks What if they ask right away, what is this call about? You do your question. Yeah. All right. Like if, if you told me that, right, and I'm doing the Stratify pitch, I'd be like, well, the reason I'm calling is um, uh, we speak to a lot of wealth advisors that are copying together tools of X, Y, and Z to create a risk profile. I'm curious today, how do you create risk profiles for your clients? Now you have a question to ask, right? Again, when you were in pitch mode, it sucked when you got asked that because that felt like an objection. But now you're going to ask a really provocative peer question that's going to get them to open up and talk. Right. Yeah. So, so now you have a good response. Now you can feel good about your cold call. Yeah. It's, and again, it's like you're constantly passing the baton to the prospect. And so, no, 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 hot potato, your turn. It's your turn to talk, dude. <laughs> I'm not going to talk the entire time. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. Um, Eli Shine asks, uh, what if the person says, oh, we've just started with a competitor? Yeah. I beg, hey, that's great. Um, I, I, my timing sucks. Go, go figure. This is classic me. Yeah. <laughs> this is so me. But um, let me ask you this: um, since you guys already went through, you know, all, all that all that work in figuring out what you wanted and finally committing to something, probably now is not the right time, as you set it up. I'd imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, would it make sense for me to reach out six months from now, or maybe a little bit towards renewal for this? And, and check in then, you know, or, or is this kind of off the table? You know, it's, it's okay. You miss the window, right? Like sales is a game of timing. And unfortunately, your buyer's timing isn't aligned to your cold calling blocks. <laughs> like yeah. if only the world was that easy. So it's cool. I mean, if somebody just bought something, it's like, cool. Well, congrats. Must have been a ton of work. You're probably still setting it up. When do you think I should reach out? Should I wait a little bit? Or should I wait a lot of it? Yeah. So one thing it sounds like you're totally fine with is not getting a conversation, not getting a, a meeting, you know, from, no. from the call. And it's it's like, why waste your time on people that are not, they're not even really interested in talking about like whether or not they might buy your stuff, you know? So it's like, it's not, not even like the timing isn't even right, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe like one or two more. Uh, Pascal asks, what if, so if the person says, you know, I'm pretty satisfied with what I'm currently using, why should I change? Yeah, I love this. I love this objection because I want to be a smart aleck a little bit right now. Again, knowing who you're talking to, right? Like this is, this is your, you're the professional caller. They're not the professional phone answer. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you, you need to read the room and understand, is this person like saying like a crab? Is there, are they saying that because they're just letting, giving me some information? What's, what's happening here? Right. But, but the response that I like to go with is when I hear something like that I'd be like, are you like happy, like married or, or happy? Like it's getting the job done. Right. Are, are you satisfied? Like it's the greatest thing ever, or it's good enough. Like, tell me where we're at. Cause there's a lot of shades of good, right. Good might be like, 
yeah, it works. Or good might be like, it's really good. Yeah. You know, so open them up a bit, right? Open them up a little bit with that, right? It's, it's okay. Dude, I love it, man. We're out of time. Um, I'm going to drop, uh, definitely follow up with all you guys on LinkedIn. I dropped in his uh, LinkedIn profile in the chat. Let's give him some love. Let's send him some connection requests on LinkedIn. Um, Bilal, thank you so much, man. Like, seriously, I look up to you so much in this stuff and the questions and like all this other, it's just, it's just awesome, man. Um, I appreciate I it so much today. I really want to double down on these provocative questions and like the work I'm doing with my clients. I really want to help them ask questions that just like, where the prospects like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's this? You know? <laughs> um, it definitely, it definitely works. So thank you so much for coming on, man. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for having me, Jason. Yeah. Let, like think provocative. All right. Go out there, ask a great question, make them think for a second, all right? And be open, right? Validate yourself. You're the professional. It feels good when you get to flex, you know what I mean? So flex on the phone and show them like, hey, cold calling, that's my business. That's my game, all right? Let me show you how it's done. So yeah. this is your chance. Nail it in that first 20 seconds, dynamically change the call for yourself. Dynamically change the call for yourself. Dude. And send me the results. That's all I add is that if you get results doing this, send it to, I'd love to hear good or bad. What happens? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I dropped this LinkedIn profile in there again, you guys make sure to connect with uh, Bilal on LinkedIn and I'll be sending out the recording later today or sometime uh, early tomorrow morning. So you guys have it. All right, everyone have a good rest of your week. Good luck on those cold calls. Bye. <laughs>